Well, I'd just like to do a little straw poll here and work out what you do during the week. So um, just put your hand up if you actually go to a job during the week that you do, that you get paid for. Okay, all right. Now, what about if you care for somebody like an infant or an aged parent? Okay. Uh, what about if uh, you're a student studying at the moment? Got any students? Okay. A couple of students. That's good. Uh, and uh, what about if you're retired? <laughs> okay. All right. And, okay, now all of you are still working. Mo most of us, work. I, I just want you to understand that when we look at this topic today, I, I'm not talking to CBD workers here, I'm talking to human beings who are being given the job to work in their lives, it's part of who we are. We're going to do a helicopter view of the Bible, uh, it, we're going to fly very, very quickly through Genesis, right through to um, Revelation, and it won't be everything, but at least, hopefully, it will give you a framework for you to understand work in God's um, great grand purposes. But to kick off, I want to have a look at this little clip with uh, and, uh, Downton Abbey and see whether you can uh, just pick up what's going on here. Right, if you just rest your cursor on it, then a little thing will come up where you can press. That's it. What will you do with your time? I've got a job in Ripon. I said I'll start tomorrow. A job? You do know I mean to involve you in the running of the estate. Oh, don't worry. There are plenty of hours in the day. And of course I'll have the weekend. What, what is a weekend? <laughs> uh, dear old Maggie, uh, uh, Maggie uh, Smith, she doesn't, uh, she's cloistered in the um, world of Downton Abbey and she doesn't even know what a weekend is. Um, let alone a week of work. But then you can't be really that unfair on her. She's learned her view of work from someone. It's been shaped in her from somewhere. And come to think of it, probably who shaped your view of work? Who put your idea of what work is together in your head over the years? I um, grew up in a working class family. I had a dad who worked as a foreman at Coca-Cola and a mum who was the deli manager at Woolies. And they used to go off to work and then they come home and on the weekends they went to work again. Uh, they cleaned, they fixed the house, they swept, they painted, they cooked. It was unthinkable to rest in our family on the weekend. If you had a lie down, had a little bit of a snoozy poos in the afternoon, they'd call an ambulance, something's wrong, he's dying. That, that was how I saw work. Now your view of work is highly personalised too. It's come from somewhere. Along the way, it might be family, it might be the work cultures you've been immersed in, it might be an inspiring teacher who said some golden rule to you about how to, how to work. Um, but Daniel Doriani has got a great definition in his book, uh, Work, Its Purpose, Dignity and Transformation, and that's the one I want to look at today. It's by David Miller, and it says, work is not merely about making a living while avoiding sin, it's extending the kingdom rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great vision for work. It's not just about getting out there and keeping your nose clean as a Christian and just getting through it and, you know, ducking back home and avoiding sin. It's about extending the kingdom rule of the Lord Jesus Christ as you move out into that world that you're in. Our approach to work is unwittingly shaped by our, uh, our vision, if you like, for work. And I want to try and put towards to you today a vision which comes from the Bible of how work should be seen for us. If you're exploring the Christian faith today, well, you know, you probably heard everyone else's take on work. Why not hear what God has to say? If you're a Christian here today, well, what we're talking about now, today on Sunday, might be very, very helpful for you tomorrow when you get to work. Okay, so to do this, we have to start at the end of the whole story. And the end of the story is the final picture of the Bible, which is one of rest. It's not dissimilar to what most people are striving for all throughout their work lives. A mate of mine bought a house on the York Peninsula with some money he got from his father-in-law. And he would say to me, I'm going to pack the 
fishing rods, the dog, the kids, the wife, and we're going off to the York Peninsula. And he just, it sh he shorthanded it to, we're going off to paradise. That's what he'd say every weekend. That was until his wife was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. It was very aggressive. And within months, she died. And I, I tell you, as a neighbour watching him, it was heartbreaking to see his dream dismantled before his eyes. You know, he sold the property over there in the end. And it was devastating. God's picture of rest eclipses whatever we can dream up for ourselves. C.S. Lewis once said, we are like children who are content to make mud pies in our backyard when we've been offered a holiday by the sea. We're far too easily pleased. Not too difficult to please, too easily pleased. We settle for less than what God has in store. Whatever it is inside of you, I don't know what you think you might do when you retire, you know, whether you've got a bucket list of things that you think you'll do or whether it's sailing the Great Barrier Reef, but that longing inside of you to rest, that's put there in your DNA by God. And you must not let it be something shriveled up, which is what many people settle for. How so? Well, now we can go back to the beginning of the story that we heard from Genesis. And in the opening book of the Bible, we meet God and God is presented to us as a worker. 35 times in chapter 1, God is working and he's creating and he's making things. Listen to it. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Now reflect on this. This is radical, what it's saying here. This is different to all the other creation stories that were around at the time. So much of those other stories were demeaning and negative about physical work. And they portrayed man being made to work for the gods. But here we've got God working for us. Um, in the ancient Babylonian creation story, there's essentially a war. And after the war gets done and the process of the world is made, um, then uh, there's the tiresome task of trying to keep it going. And so the league god says, oh, okay, what are we going to do here? Oh, we'll make human beings, and then they can basically be our slaves and keep the world going for us. If you go to Greek mythology, you've probably heard of the story of Pandora's box, or you know the word, Pand opening a Pandora's box, that phrase. Well, what that is about is Zeus creates um, Pandora, uh, first woman he creates, and then he gives her a, a, a box, and he says, you can have the box on one condition, you're not to open it. Of course, what does Pandora do? She opens up the box. Guess what comes out? Come on, guess. <laughs> Everything nasty. So death, decay, and work. Work comes from the same place as death in Greek mythology. So you've got all this background going on in the, in the wider, wider scheme outside of the Bible saying that work is a bad thing. Now, you don't have to go far in 2024 to meet people who still think the same way as the ancients. But Genesis flies in the face of it. God makes us from the earth. And what you see in Genesis 2 is God with dirt under his fingernails. I remember one time I was working in a church and, and I was serving communion. I'd been gardening the day before and I was really embarrassed that I actually, they could see and the, a, a guy said to me afterwards, he was looking at my fingers, you know, as I handed him communion. And then afterwards he said, oh, I like a man who's got dirt under his fingernails. Um, but basically that's what we've got here with God. And it's good. Genesis 1 and 2 tells you work has dignity. Even the most menial tasks are given some sort of status because God himself is a worker. God cultivates, keeps, stewards, fills. So what he's saying is work can be a blessing. You think about the um, paramedic who picks you up uh, in a car trauma accident. God forbid, but if it happens. He knows exactly what to do. He knows what to check. He knows what steps to take. He, he's, not a, you know, he's not running around with a chook with its head off. If you go to the patient accountant with your little shoebox full of receipts and say, oh, please make sense of my life before I do my tax return, well, they can bring order out of chaos for you. 
What we see here is work is a good thing in Genesis 2. And when we work, whether we're paid for it or whether we're not, when we work, we steward this world and we collaborate with God. And somehow we're reflecting our creator in that whole process. But of course, it's only half the story. You know that. You know the work's gone wrong because we read from chapter 3. And you know from experience the work's gone wrong. After the first human beings disobey God by eating from the one tree they're told not to, that unraveling impact affects the way that we work. Listen to the curse. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. What do you notice here that's significant? Five times in three verses, eating, eating. It's the way that we got ourselves into trouble, and now we pay for it. We pay for our sin in the eating. What was once provided for must now be secured through sweat, toil, and struggle. And the frustration of trying to put food on the table, for those of you who have tried to do this, the frustration of that is a faithful reminder to you of this disobedient act back in Genesis chapter 3. As fast as we come up with solutions for things in this world, as they go wrong, new problems emerge for us. Certainly happens in the IT area. In the middle of the pandemic, a phone line in our house went dead. And of course, that meant that the, the, the internet went dead. And in the pandemic, I was running this ministry from my home. So basically, I hadn't, you know, this little bunny was in a flat trying to work out how to connect to people. So I got in the phone queue to my call center and I secured a visit of a technician. He came out. These people have lots of power when they come out to you like this, you know, because you're sitting there and you're thinking, I've got to get this phone line to work. And he, he walks around, you know, arms folded. Ah, oh, yeah, here's the, here's the problem down here. See, you've got a massive tree here. The, the line's underneath that tree, uh, underneath that tree root. It's been all damaged and stuff. And unfortunately, that line only runs to your house. You're the only house that's serviced by that line. So um, we're not, we're not going to be able to reconnect that. But, and then he sort of smiles. He says, the, the MBN is coming. The MBN is coming. And then he walked out of my life. I walk back in. I go and ring the MBN hotline. They're really, really angry. I said, oh, we're not connecting you up until the end of the year. It was August. I'm thinking, that's August. So I get back on the phone line to my call provider center. And by this time, you know, I've been on that call queue for so long, I could deliriously sing along to the music by this stage. And they finally bring out another technician. The technician comes out. He has a look. And he fixes it. He just fixes it. I said to him, how come you can fix it and the other one couldn't? He goes, ah, yeah, well, on the weekend, we have contracted technicians. And they get paid for how many jobs they turn up to, not how many jobs they fix. So according to my calculations, there was five separate people who were frustrated with that work scenario. So I say with some confidence, what has frustrated you with your work this week, this last week? Because <laughs> I know that your work can be frustrating. The writer of Ecclesiastes captures it. He says this, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Who knows whether he'll be a wise man or a fool. Yet he'll have control over all the work into which I poured my effort and skill under the sun. So we work so hard sometimes and we do things, and then we see it all go down the drain. And the Bible understands that. Think about the simple act of cleaning. I mean, you vacuum the floors, you wipe the bench tops, you dust the furniture, you wash the stains off, the clo uh, off your clothes, you scrub that bathroom and the shower recess, and you do that over and over and over again. A lifetime of cleaning. And what's the reward at the end? You're six feet underneath all that dirt. Have you thought about that? There's a cruel irony to this. So no wonder we gravitate to one of two extremes. We either become workaholics and we say, I'm going to get this. I am going to get on top of this thing called work. Or we say, you know what? I'm going to skip this 
I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to shortcut this. Which do you lean towards? Are you an overworker? Are you an underworker? Because I can tell you, both of them are responses of frustration to work not working properly anymore. I think there's a summary here of where we're up to with this. God's good. God creates work. Work has created good. We're designed to work, but work's also painful. It's frustrating because we're now dislocated from God. And that's why a person who can't cope with the thought of their selves being retrenched is sort of going, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And then you meet them a month later and they've landed another job and it's a dream job and they're saying, oh, I've got no time left. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. So how is God going to deal with this dilemma that we have with work? Well, he sends Jesus into the world to work. What's his work? Well, you know, not just carpentry. Have a listen to what Jesus says. He says in John 5, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. What prompts this? Well, he's in the middle of healing someone, and he cops a whole lot of criticism for this from the Pharisees because he's fixing someone else up on the rest day, the Sabbath day. Interesting, the rest day. The day to be restored. They're criticizing him. He takes an invalid impacted by the fall and he chooses the Sabbath day to, to restore him and bring him back to full health. And that's Jesus' goal. He's trying to get us back to life in paradise. And so he works to bring people back to their creator from whom they're now estranged. He says at another point, in uh, John chapter 4, 34, my food, in other words, what keeps me going, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, what makes me think that him dying on the cross is finishing his work? He does say on the cross, it is finished. I think it's more than the horrific execution that he's going through, but it's the whole grand task that he's going through here of finally reversing the effects of the fall. That's why Jesus' ministry, if you go to a theological library and look up Jesus, his work, his life, his death, you'll see it's titled The Work of Christ. I mean, you think your job's hard some days. Think about what Jesus did for you. He did the ultimate hard work for this world to secure the ultimate rest for human beings. How do you know if it worked? Well, it would have to start reversing the effects of what happened because of the fall. And if there's anything that makes a mockery of your work, it's the fact that you die yourself. Jesus' resurrection tackles that head on. It's more than a party trick. It's the surest evidence that Jesus' work actually succeeded in the end. It's the forerunner of many resurrections to come. Do you know on the... On the night before he died, Jesus grabs his disciples together as the mob are closing in, and he says these words to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You think about this. What's the effect when people prepare ahead of your arrival? If you go to an Airbnb, you know, you get there and they go, oh, they made us some homemade biscuits, or, oh, there's some chocolates on the, um, on the pillow. Or, oh, they've, um, they've re put the fireplace together and they've got the fire all set up. All I have to do is light a match. Why do they do that? They're invested in you. They prepare. Their preparation says to you that they value you. So what you've got here is Jesus, the night before he goes to the cross, he says, I'm going ahead to prepare for you. Of all the pictures you could paint to depict heaven, the dominating one that keeps coming up in the Bible over and over again is one of rest. What does God do after he finishes creating this world? Rests. What gets lost when human beings disobey him? Rest. What's been eluding people ever since? Rest. What does Jesus say? 
to tired and weary workers. He says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you a few more jobs. No, he doesn't. I will give you rest. Isn't that what most people are hanging out for? Human beings at this point. It's that great human longing. If you don't believe me, you know, you just take another look at that person at work who strangely seems to be singing and humming along to themselves and have a little spring in their step. And you go, what's going on here? Ah, they're going on holidays next week. At the gym I go to, I, I tell you, on Monday mornings when you walk in and you say, g'day, everyone goes, hello. You get to Friday and say hello, and hi. <laughs> There's a whole change in the tone because they're coming up for a rest. We're created to work, we're wired for rest, and rest is so much more than the absence of work. I mean, you can go and lie on the beach at Port Douglas and be about as restless as a dog with fleas. You know, unable to enjoy it. Unable to enjoy your relationships with other people. And that's ultimately because rest is being reconciled to yourself, to the people around you, and to God. So Jesus, and being a, he, he wins that peace for us with God through his death on the cross. And that is the ultimate in delayed gratification. That is really your superannuation on steroids, spiritually speaking. A follower of Jesus can go out into the world and work because they know they're invested in something much greater than what they're doing. The great work of Jesus, reconciling people to God, and they're prepared to talk about that to people around them, even if people think they're crazy, because they know that this is what makes life indispensable in the end. Made for work, work's gone wrong, Christ's mighty work at the cross secures a rest for us that we will never find on our own. What sort of rest? Well, if you go to the book of Revelation, it's interesting because this is an area where Christians diverge and they have different you know, ideas on what the future of work is and what we're going to be doing in heaven. But this is all about how much of this world continues and how much of it stops when we cross over into the new heavens and the new earth. We know for a fact from what Jesus said that marriage doesn't transfer through into the new heavens and the new earth. It's a thing that's in this world only. Now, you can go through and you can try and list all the things if you want to, and I guarantee you that'll take you up until Jesus returns, but it's probably not a good use of your time. But Revelation's broad description of what the new heavens and the new earth are like at least conclude to me that um, there are some occupations that won't be needed when we get to heaven. We won't need doctors. There's no more sickness, no more tears. So we probably don't need psychologists and counsellors. Um, we definitely don't need lawyers anymore. There'll be no problems there. And you won't need wedding planners or evangelists. But beyond that, I'm just giving you some tentatives, all right? So I'll give you one tentative at this. Um, Revelation 22, verse 3. If you go to the next slide. Yeah. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. His servants will serve him. It appears that when we get to heaven, there is actually work to do because we're serving God. Now, for those of you, I love music, but for those of you who aren't thrilled at the thought of maybe singing choruses for the rest of eternity, forever, this is encouraging. You won't be just there in a disembodied state singing. You will actually be able to contribute to eternity through your service. The word's different to worship there. It's part of worship, but it's definitely serving. All right, um, just skip through the next one. We'll go to the last one, that one. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, for they will rest from their labours. Now, that word labour there, it's the Greek word that takes up all the stuff of Genesis 3. It's all the toil and the struggle and the fatigue. And it says it's not going to be there in heaven. 
So in heaven, the tension between doing deep work which absorbs you and satisfies you, and you come away and you think, oh my goodness, I've missed a meal in all this because it's been so interesting. And that work which wears you down to the bone, that tension will be resolved. Ultimately, work is not the opposite of rest. Imagine all the things you love about your work, the satisfaction, the joy it brings to other people, the sense of progress, but without the confusion, the miscommunication, the annoyance, the angst, and the IT gremlin. So what you'll have in heaven, you'll be singing, thank God it's Monday, not thank God it's Friday. Jesus declared in John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's very interesting that he says that because he's linking um, our motivation for why we live in a fallen world right back to himself. He's saying, in a fallen world, you try and sustain yourself. You try and put that bread on the table. He says, I'm the bread. I'm the bread that you're trying to put on the table. Those deep longings will be satisfied in me, he says. So Jesus offers a new paradise. It's far better than the one that we left behind in Eden. We're not going back to that. We're going to something better and forward. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you are surrounded by a world of people who are rushing about and they are laboring hard to secure a fool's paradise. Can you see that? Nothing they work for will satisfy them in this world. Not their deepest needs anyway. Are you convinced about that? Because it will change the way that you go about your work. It really will. Christians often make some of the best workers. Now, don't repeat this, but you know Brenton Ragless, who was on that. He, he does the news. Brenton goes about his job. And I know for a fact that when Channel 9 put out the thing to their workers, who wants to go to the Olympics, Brenton forgot about it. But they sought him out to go. And you know why he could go to that and be unaffected by all the, you know, the prestige and fame of it? Because he's not expecting it. He's not pumping it to give him everything he needs in life. So he's sort of freed up as a worker. And that's what Christians are like, I think. We're freed up because we're not pumping the world to deliver all the goods. You can have a comprehensive and a thoroughly thought out view of why you're working and why the world that you work in is sometimes frustrating. Do you realise that? Other people don't. They go, oh, why is work frustrating today? Well, you have the solution to that. You've thought through it. It's come from God. That's when you need to go deeper. You don't have to sort of magically think about something here to try and introduce Jesus into the situation. You've got it just in the way that you go about your work and what you know about why it is so frustrating. Think about how you can answer those questions. Think about how you can ask the questions of others. Why do you think work's so frustrating? Why are you working? Jesus says, come to me. I'm the bread of life that you're working so hard to find. Eat freely. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this. Well, we have this love-hate relationship with work. Please redeem us in the process so that we can be great witnesses to you in workplaces that you put us in, in all the sorts of different jobs we do. Help us to think about how those jobs can reflect creation and also where we're going uh, to heaven. Amen.